it's I like it to be as organic as possible. Absolutely. <laughs> good to see you, dude. <laughs> So good to see you too. It's been a while. I it's felt been a, minute. a little bit has happened. I know, dude. So listen, I in I interview all kinds of people on this show, and it's always people doing big things, right? Everything from people getting out on their first couple of walks to people that are out crushing these big ultra marathons. But I have to say, I think that you had the biggest summer of anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'll take that as a compliment coming from you. Oh, dude, it's awesome. <laughs> I don't know how you could top it. So, um. Washington's 100 tallest peaks. It took you 50 days, 23 hours and 43 minutes. You covered 869 miles with 411,000 vertical feet. Dude, <laughs> I'm guessing, yeah. I'm guessing there's a couple <laughs> stories in there somewhere. Uh, you know, I had one, one person say to me, it's like, man, I come away from climbing one mountain with like stories to tell for, for years. <laughs> like, what is it like for you? I'm like, I'm still processing, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, you're trying to download a huge file and you just sit there and watch the bars spin on the, on the screen. It's like, I'm still processing stuff where mm -hmm. I, I'll like wake up and be like, oh, that happened. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> I, I almost forgot about that. Wow. Um, but dude, yeah. I mean. The stats alone, like after I finished, because I, I intentionally didn't let myself look into like, oh, how many miles will I be covering or how much okay. burn is it? Because I didn't want to know going really? in. Really? <laughs> right? I wanted, I just wanted to be able to only think about each day's experience and each day's challenge and just live the life, you know? Incredible. Um, but like you zoom out and you think about it, it's like, that's a lot of miles and that's a lot of vert. And this isn't like on roads or on trails. This is, um, Washington is a temperate rainforest, right? Okay. It's like, the only temperate rain. So it's like thick, nasty, schwacking miles. Really? And, and, you know, boulder talus hopping and scree mm -hmm. and fifth class climbing and glacier travel. And so it's not like, you know, this 869 miles was just like, oh yeah, okay. It was a trail run. Right. Um, which makes it like all the more unreal to think about, like <laughs> trying to convey that uh, as a part of the story. Because I mean, it was, it was unreal. Like I knew I was going to be tested and that's why I stepped into this challenge from the beginning. Like I wanted it to be, you know, as, as the culminating project of this mm -hmm. hundred FKTs project, Yeah, I wanted the hundred peaks to be truly epic mm. and it totally delivered. It was <laughs> unreal. The levels I went to pushing myself out there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, dude, I want to hear all about it. It sounds so fascinating and, and just like the craziest, coolest summer anybody could ever have. It's like going out and chasing waves all summer long. You're out chasing mountains. I, I love it, man. And uh, congrats on, on everything that's, that's coming along. It sounds like you got a film coming out. Uh, tell me about that and tell me about the, the film crew and the whole process. Absolutely. Um, so Athletic Brewing was the backing. Um, they got really stoked oh, on this 100 FKTs nice. project. I've got, one, I've got um, one right here, brother. Athletic Brewing right there. Awesome. Yes, <laughs> um, I, I probably would be drinking one, but I already drank the one I brought to work today. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, um, I love them. I love what they're all about. They, they fell in love with my story. They, they wanted to back a film. They partnered with Wizard Media, who was phenomenal to work with mm. through this project. And they've done an amazing job. Uh, they're actually just doing the first premiere in Park City, side by side with The Alpinist. Um, wow. And that's on October 22nd. And so, yeah, they just released the official trailer and they just um, announced that. So super excited about that. That's, you know, happening today. Um, was the release of it. So kind of a lot of stoke going on. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Is that a full length film or just it's a short be, film? It's a, it's a 30 minute short doc. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. And have these guys done a lot of documentaries before or anything like this? They, they're pretty experienced. They hadn't done anything specific to FKTs, mm -hmm. um, but they've done, done a gamut of things in the outdoors. Um, so they, they were pretty experienced and they were able to run and gun this one pretty well with a small team. Okay. Um, yeah. So it wasn't one person following you around. There was a couple of people shuffled into the mix. No. Yeah. There was, there was a, there was a crew for sure that they, they traded out different, different camera people, different sure. people on photography, um, same director the whole time, Lauren Steele. She was amazing. Um, Anna was there. Anna Callahan as well was there the whole time. They're both phenomenal. Um, and yeah, then, then the rest of the crew kind of, it was like, okay, who can be there? Who can get out in the mountains mm -hmm. uh, during this time to catch him? Yeah. Um, yeah. It made it kind of a wild experience for them too. 
Yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah, they could. I'm sure they have stories of their own. <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, I, I I can attest to that. Yes, they do. Where um, are we going to be able to see the movie? Um, so it's going to be making showings in various film festivals. Uh, it'll make its way kind of around the country, especially here. Um, you know, from you know Colorado through the Pacific Northwest and all that. Cool. Um, and then there should be a big push um, to release it digitally and have some showings at the Athletic Brewing breweries on both sides of the country, one in Connecticut, one in uh, San Diego, um, and then a release digitally nice. um, in February. Okay. So, so cool. it'll kind of ride the, ride the film circuit for a while, and then, then there'll be the big push out so that people can watch it at home. Awesome. Are you involved with that filmmaking process at all? I mean, I know you did all the hard work, but are you behind the camera, like doing offering any suggestions, music, editing, anything crazy like that? I've not been much involved with the creative process. I left that to, you know, the experts um, sure. as, you know, a, a subject should, and that's that's the way it's done. I mean, I definitely got to participate in bits and pieces where, where like, I had something, you know, a passionate bit that it's like, this is what matters. And of course, they're, they did a great job telling my story and conveying the things I value in the world. Mm. Um, so obviously, I had a huge influence there. Um, but all, all the final editing and um, the the post uh, production, you know, just left that in their hands. And a lot of this stuff with distribution and getting it out. I mean, they're the experts. So yeah. I, I'm obviously, you know, I've made connections like this conversation I'm having with you, right? Like I've built these relationships with people over time with this project, and and they're they're allowing me to like connect with people and share my share my trailer and talk about the documentary and and you know that way it's authentic and grassroots and I don't feel like I'm letting my communities down that have supported me through this thing mm -hmm. so yeah. so I do love that about it cool um, well I can't wait to see it man I'm pretty pumped I saw the trailer for the first time today and uh, it looks pretty exciting so there's um, uh there's some some moments that uh, make you sit on the edge of your seats in that <laughs> <laughs> big time big time that's why I couldn't wait I, I just can't wait to see it man um, and it's called uh, The Journey to 100, correct? Journey to 100, yeah. Sweet, sweet. Well, we'll be looking for it, man. So this project started with you, and correct me if I'm wrong here in any of the, the story, but I, you set out to do 100 FKTs, and that's more than anybody's done at this point. So you have the highest number of FKTs. And for your 100th, you set out to do the 100 highest peaks in Washington to, to top it off. You know, that, that's going to be the big uh, finale, right? And in the meantime, you snagged a couple more FKTs, it looks like. So you're not only at 100 now, but I think you're at like 104 or something like that. Yeah. So it turns out that as I did the uh, Washington Bulgers, I broke a few other records along the way, just with like single day pushes within the project. Cool. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a, a cool side effect. Um, doesn't make my, it, it messes my list up. So now the Washington Bulgers doesn't sit as number 100 since those yeah. other ones kind of bumped it up to like 104 <laughs> or 103 or whatever. Mm. Um, but whatever, it was the symbolic hundredth and, and, the fact that I set a few others during the project is just kind of like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you said this really delivered. Um, I want to hear about it. But when you're like in retrospect now, looking back at the hundred FKTs you set before this, and then this big project, like what are the big standout moments? Is it this last 100 peaks that you put together in 50 days? Is that like the, the literal grand finale and in the best moments or like, how, how do you look at this whole project? It's just huge. Oh man. There's so many bits of gold all along the way. Right. Cause, cause a lot of the projects I did along the way were of various sizes. Um, some quite enormous, like the Rainier infinity loop others, you know, really small, like uh, the Epic Blarney loop. Uh, it's a slot Canyon loop. That's only two miles long, but just like a, full on sprint obstacle course race to like make these technical moves through these uh, technical canyons. Um, and so I had this huge variety and some of them were very appealing to different crowds, different groups, you know, obviously like an obstacle course racer is going to love um, like those canyon loops. And I think actually Max King came out and, and snagged mm, one, you know, that, nice. the legend Max King. Yeah, uh, totally. He came and snagged one of those technical canyon loops from me, one of the uh, ding and dang canyons. So like, all these little different sub stories got to be a part of this overall project where I got to be connected with different people, whether they're young and upcoming athletes or athletes who are well-established that are like, oh, that's just really cool. And I'm in the area because of whatever race or, uh, you know, camp that I'm doing. And I'm going to go out and tag one of these. 
Um, so there was like these sub stories that were a part of the whole story arc that I got to be a part of and I got to build these relationships that I never would have had. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like all those little things were also test pieces to build skill sets, to build problem solving, to build logistical skill, um, to, to test myself. And so, yeah, this final 100 peaks really was, I mean, probably in and of itself as enormous as all 99 other FKTs along the way, mm -hmm. right? It, it's like this massive project, fatigue, nutrition, like all of it, all woven into this, this package where, okay, you're, you know, 21 days deep, you're fatigued, you're at your fighting weight down to, you know, 5% body fat or less, um, you're running haggard, and you're going to go out and spend six hours on fifth class terrain, or you're going to spend, you know, four hours traversing a technical glacier. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it was everything I wanted the project to be and more. Um, and so it, it looms, it looms large in my mind. And I don't think it looms large just because it's the most recent. I mean, it genuinely is enormous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm guessing that you couldn't have really done this hundred mile or this hundred peak adventure as fast as you did without the previous 99 as sort of a practice, right? Oh, absolutely not. Um, yeah. I would, I would absolutely not recommend this route, this list of a hundred peaks uh, <laughs> to anyone without a deep, deep well of experience yes. in, in bushwhacking and route finding, orienteering, um, in, in yeah, glacier travel, all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's a lot of places you can get yourself killed. Like it's not, it's not casual. It's not driving to a trailhead and walking up a trail to the summit with a few third class moves along the way. It's like, there's a few of the peaks that are like that for sure. Um, you know, four of the peaks have trails to the top. Okay. Um, but there's a lot that it's, you're very deep back country. And if you mess up a decision, help's not going to get to you real fast. For sure. Yeah. No, it makes sense, man. Um, so how did this start? The last time I talked to you, this was just kind of an idea and it was kind of brewing in your head and you're like, yeah, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna go out and do the highest hundred, the Bulger's, uh, you know, the Bulger's list. And I'm like, no kidding as your final 100, but it was just an idea at the time. And, you know, I don't think you or I, neither one of us knew if, if it was really going to come into fruition. We both hoped it would, but, uh, yeah. How did this all start? I mean, so it, it, it first came across my radar, and I, I think I said this to you the last time we were talking, when I saw a thread in a discussion forum chatting about, well, what is the iconic Washington route? You know, Colorado has its Nolan's 14, um, but what is Washington's iconic route? And, you know, I was listening to, you know, while reading different people tossing these ideas around, reading their opinions and thoughts and you know, this or that, and oh, this doesn't quite capture this part of Washington and such and such. And someone threw the Bulger's list in there. And, you know, the, the author of the original post was like, well, you know, that's big, but it's not kind of, I'm looking for like a, you know, you know, two day or three day package deal that portrays uh, Washington, kind of like, you know, Nolan's. Nolan's, yeah. Um, and anyways, there was some discussion that happened in the sub thread related to the Bulger's and someone dropped the line, oh yeah, that, the record right now is 410 days and it's going to stand for a long time. <laughs> um, and I just like, as a mountain athlete, looked at that and I was just, you know, not to be rude or anything, but it was like, in my head was like, yeah, no, that's going to get beat by somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, like I know what's possible. Like okay. I've seen what other athletes do and someone's going to bust. And that was, that was all the more thought I had about it. Anyways, fast forward like a year and a half from there and suddenly I'm knocking at the door of hundred FKTs and people start asking the question, well, what are you going to do for a hundred? And I'm like, well, I hadn't thought about it. I just kind of go out and do whatever the weather is good for that. I'm passionate about that. I've had, you know, done the planning on and I'll just pull the trigger. Like it doesn't matter the order to me. Um, just go do what you can go live, live, live the life you can in the time you've got it. Yeah. And so I was like, well, maybe I should put a little thought into this hundredth and make it a little bit of a celebration, like something big. And then I forget exactly how, but the Bulgers came back across my radar and I started looking into it. It's like, man, there's like fifth class terrain and there's route finding and there's bushwhacking and there's logistics and there's all these different components that have been a part. And, you know, being a teacher, it's like, I think a lot about like, what is a quality cumulative examination? How do you create an exam that, you know, tests all of the content covered in a course? And it was like, this is it. Like, there's nothing there's nothing out there that's going to test what I've done in the Pacific Northwest and other places like this list. Mm -hmm. And 
it became even it became bigger in a sense, right? Because it wasn't any more just about me. It was also about this historic Bulgers list and sort of showing the community that's built up around it, the the you know Pacific Northwest mountaineering community, um, kind of con demonstrating a new a new style, a new well, really what what's possible on these peaks, right? Because the perception was like 410 days is going to be an impossible time to beat because these peaks are so remote and so difficult and so challenging and technical. Um, and so it like became this sort of larger than myself project um, that it was really cool as I, and I mean, I guess you asked as well to answer your question better before I move on, you asked, you know, how did it move from just being an idea to being something I knew I wanted to do? And I think anytime we have a big idea that scares us, um, and it's floating in the back of your head as like, oh, maybe you have to move that thing. You have to move it from just being a consideration into the planning stages. Like you have to like push that stuff from the back into the front and you've got to like put pen to paper. You got to look at some maps. You got to start mapping things. And what, what's, what it's going to reveal to you on, on like a gut level is like when you start putting the pen to the paper and you start mapping stuff, either you're going to be like, you're going to notice your motivation go up sharply where your, your gut instinct, your understanding of yourself and all of you know, the world as you've seen it goes, yeah, this can actually go. And then you get even more stoked and more invested in studying even more minute details um, as you build, build out this idea more and more. Or the opposite happens where you're like, oh, my motivation dropped. Well, that's probably your gut instinct being like, this isn't going to go well. Like mm -hmm. I'm not ready for this or I don't have the skill set or something's missing here. Mm -hmm. And it's that, you know, your gut guiding you like, don't go further or, or postpone it till later, do other things first. Mm -hmm. And you might notice, uh, I had a friend that started this with a big project he's considering in the Sierras. And he noticed like his motivation for the big project dipped off, but his motivation for a smaller sub project that would be a component of that bigger project went up sharply where he's like, oh, this is what I need to do next to even consider if this bigger project's possible. Okay. Um, and so I started that with the Bulgers. I'm like, well, this is an idea. It's crazy. I have no clue if it's even possible. Like I, I, I know so little. I'd only climbed two of these peaks prior. Okay. 98 of these peaks I on-sighted. I'd never Whoa. walked a step in that area before. Wow. Um, so it's like, I had to genuinely be humble and admit like, you know, upfront tell people, I don't like, I'm not going to know what I'm doing here. Like I have the skill set to mm -hmm. perform in these spaces sure. but as far as knowing anything about the state of washington and this bulgers list and these hundred peaks and the terrain i'm i am i am humbly at the mercy of the community mm -hmm. and i was able to reach out to the prior record holder um, eric gilbertson i was able to reach out to a well-known mountaineer um, who was at one time the youngest person to finish the bulgers list matt lemke um, i was able to reach out to alden grant rhino who was in the middle of finishing the the list and now has finished um uh just right after i did and they they were kind enough like you know i had to i had to be humble and earn their respect right because they had just lost uh jake robinson uh to a crevasse accident oh, wow. um and he was a young well-respected well-loved climber and so there was hesitation right because it's like oh is this guy just gonna go out and get himself killed like is he just gonna try to solo all these peaks right and so there was hesitation, as there should be. Mm -hmm. You know, I would be hesitant if someone comes to me like, oh, hey, I want to try to repeat what you did and shave a day off. Right. I, I, would, I would be like, okay, I'll, I'll give you some initial stuff. But it's like until the person shows me that they've done the depth of research to, and they've like, like built the skill set to actually, that they should be doing something like this and that they're invested enough to pay attention to enough details to not hurt themselves or someone else. Like I'm going to be a little hesitant because it's not, it's not a walk in the park. Right. Um, so, and you know, that's no disrespect toward them. It's just, you know, it's kind of the right thing to do since this is, you know, I would feel, I would have to feel terrible for the rest of my life. And I'm like, Oh yeah, just go out and do it. And then, you know, get to read in the paper or in the you know, Alpine journal, like, Oh, accident happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it happens all the time. It yeah, happens absolutely. all the time. 
And with respect to the gentleman that did it in 410 days, you know, I'm guessing he was going out on weekends. He has a full-time job and a family and that Absolutely. was just the fastest anybody had, had done it. And you were Absolutely. able to commit these 50 days or I, you talk about it, but um, I'm guessing you're a teacher. So I'm guessing you had three months to play with and then you crushed it in 50 days. So you had a, bit, a little bit of time left over afterwards. Yep. But, I had um, about an 80 day window. Uh, um, okay. Okay. When I was, when I was doing, that was like the, the cutoff, right? Like I had to have a margin for error um, that was uh, appropriate, mm -hmm. that was acceptable. Um, and so started doing all the route formulation. What's the fastest anybody's done any group of these peaks? What are the linkups that work and don't work? And, you know, got it all penciled out and then calculated out the days. And it was like, okay, it's possible this could go in 50 days. Um, it's oh, possible. so you were planning 50 days. Yeah, 50 days is what I set out to do. Ah, um, came, came really close to doing it perfectly, right? Okay. 50 days, 23 hours, I'll take it. Still okay. needs 50, 50 days in the front. Oh, it sure does, um, man. <laughs> no, I, didn't, I didn't realize that part. I thought that you were just kind of giving yourself, you know, 70 or 80 days since you had the summer off. But that's even, even cooler, man. 50 days. Good for you. Yeah. So, yeah, I had that margin, um, that margin for error within it. So, like, even if stuff went poorly, mm -hmm. you know, something got shut down or, like, a freak storm rolled through, I would have time to, like, sit, wait it out for a bit, and then resume without being like, well, now it's over because I have to go back to work. Right. Um, right. So, yeah, no, that was a big part of it um, in, the, in the planning stages. Yeah, and I would have to guess the planning stages were just a huge portion of this, this whole yeah, like endeavor. Six Six, six months, months yeah. of planning and logistics. Yep. Doing, you know, making maps, pulling routes, pulling GPX files, re reading route descriptions, getting on calls with these guys that I mentioned. Um, yeah, no, it wow. was, it was a lot of attention to detail, a lot of time mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of love and appreciation from those guys. Like, cause they were, they invested and because that, that's what made it possible. Right. Mm -hmm. If, if I wasn't standing on the shoulders of things people from the community had done previously, there was no way this was possible. And that to me is also why I say it became larger than just myself. Like I wasn't just representing me when I went out there to do this. I was representing all of the people who invested hours of their time and, you know, people who did link ups previously that I was able to glean information from their trip reports. Like this was a representation of all of them. And, you know, like you said, to be fair to the previous record, hold, nobody had committed to this route in a way that said, okay, this route is worth showing up on day one and not going home until the project is done to see what's possible. And so that became sort of the beautiful contribution I could have. It's like, okay, I'm a school teacher. I've built this skill set. Here's here's a here's a list of peaks, a group of amazing peaks that no one has bothered to try to do this on. Um, this is this is something I can I can do. This is a, a burden I can bear, if you will. Um, an impact I can make that maybe moves the slider. Like maybe now other other athletes are sitting out there going, okay, this thing goes in a season like 410 days. Like I'm not going to take 410 days of my life to do something, but but 50 days, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I can take maybe I can take 50 days of my life and go go on an epic and see what's possible out here. Um, and actually, one of the beautiful side outcomes of this project was this kid joined me on day one, uh, Nathan Longhurst. And I mean, he's 21, like not, not a kid kid, but you know, a young fella. And so he comes in and like, we'd only chatted on Instagram uh, prior to the day one of my Bulgers effort. Um, and he was actually wanting to attempt the Rainier Infinity Loop. So he was like running some of his logistics past me. And, you know, he was like showing he was competent, like, you know, this, this huge background in skiing, this huge background in rock climbing. Um, the kid climbs five thirteens for heaven's sakes, like he's a crusher. Um, so I'm like, okay, like this, clearly you should be trying, um, an adventure like this. And so like helped him with some logistics and he ran his stuff past me. I'm like, yeah, man, you should try to break the 48 hour mark. Cause nobody has. Um, but then he's like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I got this big project, blah, blah, blah. He's like, can I join you on day one? That sounds like a perfect training run. Cause it's going to be this big 47 mile push with four peaks. Um, and I'm like, yeah, no, none of the peaks are super technical. Like if we don't get along or like if one, you know, if he's not able to hang, like he can just go back to his car and everything's fine. Sure. Um, so we start off and we end up hitting it off. Like we have a great, great day out, like an epic long day out, like 22 hours. Um, and like, he's solid the whole time. And I'm like, this is great. Okay, cool. We can definitely climb together in the future. He's like, yeah, I want to climb again. Um, he didn't go out with me the next day because he, at that point he was like, man, that was a huge day. I don't, I don't think I can follow that up with another day out. Um, 
So then he took a day off while I went out and tagged a couple more. Um, and then on the third day, he jumped back in with me. And we ended up climbing uh, 65 of the peaks together during my, my project. Wow. And he went out and reclimbed some peaks so that he could be the second person to finish the entire Bulgers list in a season. And that also made him the youngest person to ever finish the list. Wow. Um, so kind of this cool, he ended up finishing in 94 days total. No kidding. Uh, he, he skied, he skied Adams, uh, the Southwest shoots of Adams back in May. So he ended wow. up being, you know, becoming this, you know, second person to finish him in a season, youngest person to finish. And to me, that's a super cool outcome. Yeah. Um, and then through the process, like he got to redefine his sense of what was possible for him. And he, oh, he yeah. voiced that during the project, like, oh, I knew I could do big stuff. And he'd set some other FKTs before, but I'd never thought I could just go day after day after day like this. And it's like, it's a cool thing to learn about yourself when you're only 21. So oh, yeah. I'm, stoked. I'm stoked to see what he goes on to do. What's he, his name? Uh, Nathan Longhurst. Okay. I'm right. Nathan down. Longhurst. Yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll share his like uh, social media information. So you can yeah. throw it in the thread. So other people who are stoked on seeing what this kid does uh, can, sure. can follow him. I love uh, it. I love it. Okay, man. So six months of planning and logistics leading up to this thing. So the night before, like walk me through what's going through your head. Like I'm a big fan of the Rocky movies because they're cheesy and they get me pumped up. But in Rocky one, Rocky goes and he looks at the stadium and he, he's, he kind of feels the vibe in there. And then he goes back and crawls into bed with Adrian and he says, baby, I can't do it. I can't beat him. You know, mm -hmm. did you have any of those negative thoughts going through your head or were you just all stoke, just ready to go? I, I am a stoke machine. I mean, that's, that's one of my superpowers, but I think also I have this realization and, and it's become, it's become integrated into how I think, um, I biked across the United States when, when I graduated university and I can distinctly, and I've logged this memory so that I don't forget it. I can remember when the Atlantic ocean came into view. Cause I started at the Pacific and I remember the feeling of, Oh my God, I've done it. Like I've pedaled every pedal stroke of this country I grew up in. And in the very next moment, just a sinking in my spirit of, but that means the lifestyle is done. Mm. Like I don't just get to wake up and pedal East. Mm -hmm. um, and so ever since then, I've had this, this firm understanding that even when I'm racing the clock during an FKT, it's not actually about finishing. It's about the, the beyond ordinary living that happens in the moments along the way and loving the challenges and the, the life you're living as you do it. So, so as I stepped up to day one, like I fully embraced the possibility that a fire could break out the next day and it would all be over. Sure. At any point, at any point with a project this big, especially with the fires we're having now, right? Mm -hmm. um, this whole project could get ended in the snap of fingers. Right. Right? One thunderstorm, bang, done. Um, and you know, I had to embrace that unsureness and the feelings that come along with unsureness as just a part of what it was like to have an experience like this. And so it never like, you know, in, in anybody that's run a hundred miler or something like that knows you can't think about the 99 miles you have in front of you. Right. That's a guaranteed way to kill your motivation and suffer. Um, you've just got to be absorbed in the mile you're in. You've got to be absorbed in whatever problems right in front of you. You, you've got to, you've got to love that problem solving. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I did. It's like, okay, cool. Like I've got 98 peaks to on site. Some of them got, have, have this fifth class climbing. Some of them have glaciers. Some of them have bushwhacking. Some of them have a ridiculous number of downed trees. Um, so it was just embracing whatever the challenge of the moment was and being present with that. Um, and just sort of absorbing that experience and being like, yeah, yeah, here I am. This, this is my life for the next 50 days, mm -hmm. um, or, or potentially more, you know, at that point I had no clue. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, because I oriented my mind like that, I really didn't ever have doubts about the whole project along the way, which is surprising. Right. Um, I, I had, I had doubts related to very specific physiological things on day 24 i had gotten so stressed out like trying to coordinate you know boats and and then coordinate with the film crew that was trying to come out to meet me um boats well yeah you have to access some of these peaks by going in like 40 oh, miles no on a boat because that's the easiest way to get into like a, a trail that gets you into some bushwhacking that gets you to a summit wow uh, so like this thing is full on like mini expeditions within the project yeah big time um, 
and that's that's the way I came to like think about it. It's like, okay, we're going on the the Lake Chilean expedition. We're going on the Chilliwack expedition. We're going on the Lago Group expedition. Yeah. Um, so it was like you had the peaks, you had the problems that were on each peak. You had the peaks that were within the bigger expedition, and then you had that expedition within the big the the big FKT project. And so it kind of broke it down where you could always kind of just think about a layer that was smaller than the whole hundred peaks. Mm. Um, and you could just kind of be like, okay, cool. I'm looking forward to this peak in this group. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Like I've heard the, the movements on the ridgeline are phenomenal and the views are phenomenal. So get to look forward to that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, that was kind of how I oriented, oriented my mind. But on day 24, because of all the stress and we were, we tried to get a hotel room after we came out by boat and it ended up being a fiasco to try to get a hotel and we ordered a pizza to try to get some some calories and get to bed early and the pizza just never shows up and it ends up that uh, my girlfriend ashley who's like driving support on this thing has to drive down there and pick the pizza up herself um because they're so understaffed um and so what was supposed to be an ex like a long night of sleep on a comfortable bed it turns into like three hours of sleep mm. um and so i wake up the next morning and just have horrible indigestion, horrible heartburn. Um, and normally I have like a gut of steel. It's one of, you know, one of my, one of my superpowers is I can just like pound a bunch of calories, have a full stomach and keep moving. Mm, lucky. Um, and suddenly I couldn't eat anything and I just felt horrible and constant like acid reflux. And this, this whole day, like we're march marching out to bag four more peaks and I'm not eating anything. And I'm smart enough to know, like, there's no magic land. Like, you don't put calories in, eventually it all shuts down. Yep. And so I'm thinking, like, unless this turns around, this could be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk as far as I absolutely can. Um, and I'm not going to stop believing. But physiologically, if this doesn't turn around, at some point, it will be the end of the project until I can, like, get this medically sorted. Sure. Uh, and, you know, that was a pretty, like, rough thing to, like, march out there, you know, into the backcountry. Like, all right stuff's not good right now. Um, plus I'm, you know, sleep deprived. Plus I'm 24 days into begging. I forget the exact number of peaks, but I'd like, I kind of started off fast and hard on the East side to get all the most fire prone peaks out of the way. Oh. So I'd been begging these big days, um, to knock them out. And so came out of, a, a another set of those, um, the Chelan group and was kind of like, okay, after today, there shouldn't be any more peaks that are that fire prone. Um, but then of course it ends up being, you know, the insane heat wave that comes through Washington and like the second driest year on record. Um, so it's like, there wasn't really a place that wasn't fire prone. Sure. Uh, but yeah, that day, that day, day 24, I'm, I'm fairly certain it was, was one of them physiologically that was like, this could, this could be the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. But luckily about, about halfway through the day after bagging about two peaks, I finally started to be able to eat and get some more fluids down. Um, and it's like, okay, okay, we're back on. Like, you know, this is gonna, this is gonna hurt me for the next few days. Cause you know, when you're pushing that big each day, you can't, you can't make up for lost time, right? It's like, right. there's no way to just eat enough. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, about, about that same time or shortly after that, I was down to my fighting weight, as you would say, like just, you know, 4%, 5% body fat. Um, had lost like 20 pounds probably since the start, yeah. um, just super leaned out. And luckily my appetite came back and I was able to just start like pounding calories and like covering Oreos and Nutella <laughs> and eating whole packs of them at once. Wow. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So is that kind of what it looked like from day to day? Like you said, day one was uh, a bunch of miles and you were going out and bagging like four or five peaks and you were going to and then like, how much time are you in a hotel room? How much time are you camping out in the backwoods? Like, what was that like? It was a mixture of it all. Um, like I said, uh, the Chelan group that I just described um, was about seven days out. So rode the boat in and then spent seven days and then rode the boat out after tagging one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine different peaks um, on this seven day push. And you camped um, the whole time out there? Yep. Camped in the back country the whole time out there. Cool. Um, and then there were, you know, pushes like the craggies where it was bag two peaks and get back to the car in like nine hours. Um, so there were some shorter days that I like mixed in mm -hmm. as rest days kind of, sure. even though they still had like 5,000 to 8,000 feet of vert. <laughs> um, so 
yeah, it was like staggering things like that, where it's like, okay, this is going to be a 20 mile day with 14,000 feet of vert. And then this is going to be a 12 mile day with 8,000 feet of vert. That's the easy day. Then back out for another, you know, crazy 10,000 plus vert day. Um, the tough part wasn't as much the mileage. It was, it was the, the insane vert, like really? insane amount up and down. Um, in fact, one of the things that happened early on in the trip by like day five was that because of the steep angles, I was constantly climbing directly up and down the, sh the, the solid heel cup of my shoe. Um, when, when, you know, when you're dorsiflex so far walking mm -hmm. up steep hills, cause you're trying to not push off your toe every time to like not wear your calves out. So you're kind of like leaving your heel on the ground as you climb these peaks. And so my Achilles tendon was constantly just bowstring tight as sure. I'm walking. And yeah. that little bit of that structured heel cup impinged the bottom of the Achilles tendon and triggered uh, swelling in the Achilles tendon. And at first, like I, I hadn't figured out what it was, right? So I'm out there walking and suddenly it's these sharp pains every step. Like you can't think about anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, oh shoot, am I tearing my Achilles tendon from my heel bone right now? Um, am, am I like micro tearing it away? And it's like, that could be catastrophic. Like that might be game over. Yep. Um, so I start like, my brain's like problem solving, right? In between like wincing from pain. And I'm like, okay, like there's not pain when I took my shoe off. Um, so let's try flipping the heel down and walking on it. Like you know, when you're lazy getting out of bed in the morning and you just walk on the heels of your shoes and ruin yep. them. Uh, <laughs> yep. And so flipped one down on that side and sure enough, no pain. So I'm like, okay, can't be that I'm tearing the heel bone away or the uh, Achilles tendon from the heel bone. It's gotta be that this pressure is triggering this problem. But I could see that my Achilles tendon was visib visibly swollen. Um, so it's like, okay, I'm going to have to baby this. I have no clue how long. Um, so like I finished the rest of that backcountry push, like constantly flipping the bottom of my shoe down and still like climbing fourth class with, with basically a slipper on one foot. Yeah, Crocs. Uh, <laughs> and then as soon as I'm out, I'm like, all right, cutting giant V's in the back of all my shoes. Ah. Um, it was just like the obvious, like, no, don't quit. Don't go to a hospital. Like cut, cut giant V's into them. And I can send you a photo yeah. of, uh, of what I did to all my shoes that's um, smart and kept marching because like as soon as that pressure was gone and I mean I could, at, after it got triggered I couldn't have any pressure like even a different shoe that didn't have a heel cup mm -hmm. if it touched the back of my foot where my Achilles tendon was excruciating pain mm. so like I had to cut everything open in the back yeah um and it stayed that way for almost the rest of the project I can remember I was bushwhacking downhill and I'd gotten used to it just being excruciating when like a tree branch would whip around because my other foot kicked it and hit mm. me in the back of the other Achilles mm. tendon, which happens a lot when you're bushwhacking. Does, yeah. um, it would just be excruciating, like a, an abnormal amount of pain. Um, and I can remember um, deep into the project, you know, day 40 or something, I stepped on a stick and it spun around and hit me in me, my Achilles tendon. And I'm like, hey, that hurt the normal amount. Like that actually has gotten better. And I remember it being like this moment of elation, like out there, like, hey, one thing hurts less. <laughs> um, you got to celebrate the little things. Got to celebrate the little things. That's the secret. That really is the secret. Hopeless positivity. <laughs> oh, well, it sounds like you've got a lot of that. So, dude, you're the right man for this project. And this is an elementary question, but I, I don't know if you're sponsored or anything. What kind of shoes do you wear? Uh, I was wearing the... Uh, Dinafit Ultra 100s and the Dinafit Alpines for a lot of this. I did rotate in a La Sportiva Blizzard when I was on um, the volcanoes, like the really glaciated peaks, because they have the built-in micro spikes. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'd really, I'd really liked the Dinafit had sent me a couple of pairs to try out of the Ultra 100s, and I liked them because they had a good rubber for like fifth yep. class soloing. That's why I was but wondering. But also, also a comfortable like a comfortable, cushy enough ride to do, you know, big mileage. And I, I took a pair out of the box and did 50 plus miles in them. Mm. Um, and was like, no pain, no blisters. Perfect. Nice. Um, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, rocked those for a lot of the days and they're the ones I chopped up all sorts of ways. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, thanks for the shoes. Hope you're not mad. Yeah, right. <laughs> cut them all to pieces. <laughs> no disrespect, but, uh, they work better for me this, this way. <laughs> um, so yeah. 
yeah, those are the, those were the shoes. And then I think I, I rotated in a couple other just old pairs of shoes I had. Cause I was starting to like wear through stuff super quick with this brutal sure. terrain. Yeah. Um, I think I destroyed a total of seven different pairs of shoes and like 12, 10 or 12 pairs of trekking poles throughout this project. Wow. Um, and five different pairs of, uh, shorts, um, yeah, five different pairs of shorts just ripped them up from glissading or catching on rocks or while bushwhacking. Always the butt um, that rips out. Yep, yep. And I, <laughs> I, I glissaded everything, right? Because yeah. I was like, okay, even if it's 10 feet of glissading, if I choose to glissade every time I have a chance, it could add up to miles. tens of thousands of feet, miles yeah. of glissading. Yeah, For I mean, sure. when you think about what, 411,000 feet is like, what, 78 miles or something? Um, I, that my math could be off there. Someone, someone will listen to this and double check me, but it's a, that's a lot of vertical feet. Um, yeah. that's a lot of vert. So choosing any time I could to sit down and take a little pressure off my knees, take a little pressure off my joints and my muscles. Like I like consciously, I called it an experiment in learning to old, move like an old man. Um, cause it was like, I was thinking through like, which foot am I stepping off of trees that I'm going off of with? And how much impact force is there? And like, how am I stepping from boulder to boulder? And like, how loudly are my feet hitting the rock? You know, like I'm thinking about the stuff, like what's going to cause a stress fracture three weeks from now? And how can I, how can I get ahead of it now? Sure. Um, Cause like normally you do these shorter FKTs and you just, you can just yard sale, right? You can just pound your body and go, oh, I'll recover for three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, even something like the Rainier Infinity Loop, which is, you know, two days long you can go out there and write a check that's bigger than your body can cash and just be in debt for three weeks sure. or five weeks. Yeah. Um, and this one, it was like, no, no, no. In three weeks, I'm still out here. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't write any checks that my body can't fully cash that day. Yeah. Um, and so being very aware of how I'm moving over obstacles and, and moving inside the terrain yeah. um, was a really weird experience. And it's been kind of tough to overcome since to be like, no body, it's, it's okay to run fast again. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Cause that stuff got ingrained. Yeah, for sure. That's an interesting piece that uh, you've got to manage. Did you find yourself getting fitter as you went along? Like when you got to the end of this thing at 50 days, were you just completely exhausted or did you, do you feel like you gained a lot of fitness out there? I think it's uh, it's like through hikers described getting your trail legs um, takes, you know, like two to three weeks for your body to kind of go, oh yeah, we're moving every day. This is happening every day. So, and I'd kind of had various experiences that taught me that before. Like when I biked across the country, you know, there there's the first three days, just like anytime you start a workout routine where you're like sore. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another, another period of like soreness uh, and achiness about seven days in just from like being in certain positions that your body's not used to. Um, and then about three weeks in, you face the beginnings of the overtraining syndrome, um, uh, where it's like, okay, mood is going to get weird. Appetite's going to be weird. You're going to have to like stay on top of sleep because you might not feel sleepy. And so you have to like kind of force those things to stay in line while you like wade through that. And you have to like be extra cautious not to overdo it or pull a muscle by doing anything too dynamic because everything's fatigued. And then if you weather that whole process without messing anything up, then you start to like come out the other side and be like, huh, today actually felt better than yesterday. Mm. Like, like I feel more rested than I did before. I'm falling asleep easier or it's easier to eat again. Um, and that's what happened. Like, uh, I, like I said, I lost all that weight. And about that time, like when I was 24 days in, suddenly it's like, okay, uh, well not day 24, that was the day I felt sick. But after that, it was like, suddenly I could just eat and eat and eat and eat. It okay. felt like being a teenager again, yeah. um, just constant appetite constant ability to put down huge amounts of food. Um, and yeah, the body had kind of adapted and the legs started to feel better. Achilles tendons started to like recover and knees started to feel a bit better. Um, so yeah, there's, there's this element of like getting through those various stages of fatigue For sure. and, you know, getting those legs under you to be like, Oh, well, actually I do feel a little better today than I did before. Mm -hmm. But yeah. again, that's like, that's pretty, there are pretty small margins there. You have to be paying attention. It's not like you wake up and you feel a hundred percent again. It's like, <laughs> Oh, instead of feeling, instead of feeling 40%, I feel 52%. Like that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And we'll take it. We'll take it. What was your food strategy out there? Was it, eat as much as you can while you're in town, take all the leftovers and hit the grocery stores as you're going out of town and just pack up for the mountains type of thing? Or what did it look like? Absolutely. That was the strategy. Anytime, anytime I wasn't out moving, 
which wasn't wasn't much of the time you know sure. it's like these these were like you know an 11 hour day was sometimes like the easy day yeah and you know the epic days were 22 tw- nearly 24 hours one push one time mm. um so these like big days where there's just no way you're going to make up that calorie that calorie deficit right. like it's there's you just can't eat enough while you're moving your body puts out more than it can take in especially on this type of terrain um so then anytime i was in town it was eat 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 to complete stuffed you know um and just do it over and over again and then you know back out um and while i was out there um i've always kind of kept the strategy which again you know came from doing 99 prior fkt where it's like okay i take uh like a nutrition supplement that i put into and i was using uh gnarly nutrition uh, out there this time, they're fuel two O, so it's like calories in the water, electrolytes in the water, and then the fuel two O also has some amino acids in there mm. to like kind of prime your body to already be like have those metabolized to recover. Right. Um. So like that was taking cal- care of a huge chunk of my my calories that my body could absorb, but then I always bring foods for psychological benefit, right? So like that mental boost. So what am I going to look forward to eating while I'm out there? And sometimes that was salami. I'm, I have a sweet tooth, so it was it was constantly various sweet stuff. I probably I should have been sponsored by Snickers uh, almond. Um, I ate so many Snickers almonds bars, it was ridiculous. <laughs> I'm still picking still picking those wrappers out of various places that I stuck <laughs> right. them. I'm like, how did I? Why did I stick a wrapper here? What the heck? Um, so, yeah, a bunch of that stuff, and then I would always bring out something that was crunchy because occasionally I, I specifically crave something crunchy. So like Fritos chips, or sometimes I would get two birds with one stone and do like those, uh, muddy buddies checks that are, you know, covered in the peanut butter and the powdered sugar, mm. um, you know, something like that. That's crunchy. Um, and then I would do something savory. Maybe it was salami, maybe it was jerky, um, something of that nature. So that's what I got the sweet. If I'm craving sweet, got the crunchy, if I'm cra- craving cr- crunchy and I've got the savory, if that's what my body wants yeah. and just kind of always having some kind of a selection with those things, those three things. So whenever I sat down or whenever I had a moment, it's like, Oh, like I need to eat something salty. Sounds good. Let's do that. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the strategy while out moving. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, <laughs> Gosh, man, what a huge, huge, <laughs> it's, it's hard to even wrap your head around. And I know how it is when you're looking at all these different peaks. Like when I first came out to Colorado, my goal was to hike all the 14ers. And when you're look, when you're doing the research, you don't have a relationship with the peaks. It's like, okay, this peak's called Uncompagre. That really means nothing to me. I don't know what it looks. Okay. There's a picture. I still don't have any idea. And then when you get out there, you really form this relationship with it because you're out there, you're in it. You might be in it in a storm. Um, and then you have these memories that are just planted forever. Do you remember all 100 peaks or were some of them sort of blurry in there? I mean, some of them are much more easy to immediately recall, right? And others, it requires a story or a specific question to like trigger memories of them. Okay. Um, you know, I obviously can remember worst peaks. I can remember best peaks. I can remember cool linkups and ridge traverses. I can yeah. remember almost all of the fifth class climbing because I love, I love being on fifth class terrain. Um, I can remember a lot of the glacier travel. Um, I can remember some of the bushwhacks. I've tried to repress some of those memories. Um, uh, yeah, anybody that's been like a, a, an ice climber who's listening, like you'll, you'll know the water ice scale, WI1, WI2 through five, you know, five is the most epic, dangerous stuff. Um, you know, ridiculous stuff out there. We, we humorously started calling some of the bushwhacks BW5 because you'd be going through this temperate rainforest on 60 plus degree slopes where your feet would just go out from under you and you'd grab a sapling and you'd be dangling, dangling there by the sapling that you're bending. And you can't tell it like, am I six inches off the ground under there? Or am I six feet off the ground? Cause it's <laughs> like, I can't see my own feet through the brush. Right. <laughs> um, and it's just like BW five, like no clue, no clue. What's three steps in front of you. Right. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, memories like that are in there too, where I'm just like, what the hell am I yeah, doing hanging yeah. there by this tree on the side of a mountain? And it's just so slow moving. Like you, right. you, you don't have an appreciation for trails or roads or even terrible trails, like horribly maintained trails. You don't understand how much faster that mode of travel is for humanity until you've bushwhacked through true bushwhacking in like a, a state like Washington with brutal terrain and, and thick, thick growth. Um, like, it was unreal how slow the movement, like I'd be like, okay, we've got, we're going to descend 5,000 feet in, in uh, 
two miles and the tra- we'll get to the trail. It's like, okay, that can't take that long, right? It's like, mm-hmm. okay, four hours. You know? <laughs> You're gonna go downhill for four hours. Mm. Um, and it's going to be painful and you're going to fight for your life. Right. Um, right. And you just have to like embrace that. Like, yep, this is my existence. This is the experience I signed up for. Like it is okay to be here at some point. I will reach that trail, but for now, this is my life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. So yeah, there's, there's some memories like that for sure. Um, and I've had Ashley on the show. Um, was she a big part of this project too? Oh, I cannot. I, she was an absolute hero. Really? She, she had some, I think one of her biggest weeks was 60 miles um, with, I forget, like 16,000 feet of elevation gain with like a big pack on her back, like packing in resupplies and base camp sure. because my climbing partner, Nathan and I um, were doing this like epic push of five peaks and then dropping off to this point between another ridge line, and she would hike out there on the trail and have a base camp set up. And so she was doing that on some of these different pushes, uh, so that that way we could carry lighter packs as we were doing this, you know, fifth class terrain and glacier travel and all that, which is part of what unlocks this whole peak set to, to be able to be done in this manner. And so she was an absolute superhero. It was amazing, you know, like thinking like, okay, here's this little gal hauling, you know, a 60 pound pack for 60 miles, Um, (laughs) like unreal. Pretty heroic. Uh, Absolutely heroic. Uh, I cannot, I cannot speak her up enough um, at all, like how crucial she was to the success of this project. And, you know, then just like, you know, the final epic push with the all of the final volcanoes, the the final seven with, uh, you know, Shuxon thrown in there too, since it's kind of isolated. Um, she basically did like two days with almost no sleep because from the, my process, once I was out of the Chilliwax and hopping onto that was all right, this is the home stretch. I, I cut my mountaineering teeth on volcanoes. So mm-hmm. this feels like the victory lap, right? Like I know how to send volcanoes. Cool. Um, so it was like sleep in the car, climb the next volcano no extra time kind of was the was the mission and i did end up having to take one nap because i got just so wobbly on my feet that it's like okay this isn't safe um but she drove you know through the nights to get me to the next peak you know right right uh, which is straight up again heroic um during that final push and allowed me to just like take a nap wake up climb a peak take a nap wake up climb a peak like just wake up at the next peak mm-hmm. um so that was huge in the in the finishing push as well um was she out there with you the whole time she had to leave because she had a, a a climbing trip she was guiding on shasta with uh all expeditions mm-hmm. and you know that panned out well because she's going to be guiding down on aconcagua um, based off the relationship she built there. But it, it added a lot of stress. Actually, that was another huge low moment um, emotionally. I would say it was the emotional low of the project was she had left, my climbing partner had left because he's his sister got married, I think. Um, and so I'm solo. And then the fires break out that closed down Highway 20. And I like have to like find out like, is my project done? Like, is this game over? You know, I'm like, sleep deprived, fatigued in pain already. And it's like, okay, is it game over? Is this whole thing over? Like I'm out here alone. So I'm like problem solving, reaching out to, to like Alden and, you know, calling him up like, dude, what's going on? Like this fire shut down highway 20. Is there a way around it? Are any of the peaks closed? Um, and like, just kind of scrambling to like figure this out Mm -hmm. and end up losing like half a day to driving around and to like reorganizing, like what order should I do stuff? What's still possible? What's closed? and like rearrange my peak order so that I would bag the peaks that are closest to the fire first, just in case the wind shifted. So it's like, I already got those out of the way in case they get closed. Um, You know, just like running up there into the smoke next to these fires. Um, I mean, I was like a good, like 10, 20 miles away, but still it's like, that's a fire right over there. I can see billowing smoke into the sky. Yeah. Um, And like having to go through that whole thing and then still like push out there into the dark after losing my daylight hours. Um, to, like, by yourself by myself like that was it was rough mm-hmm. um that day was a, a rough emotional day to navigate and I remember the sunset that day as I'm hiking out like I finally like you know pulled myself out of it and got gotten started on the day um and as the as the golden hour hit the peaks around me and I like rounded a corner and 
two of the peaks I was going to be tagging came into view with that perfect light hitting them, that golden light. It was like, yeah, okay. Everything's going to be okay. Mm. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Um, And just kind of this beautiful experience of the gamut of human emotion, you know, doubt and fear and pain and sadness and loneliness. And then just that peace Mm -hmm. and that, that like, okay, this is still on. Let's go. Nice. Um, Those are magical moments. And that's what we're looking for out there. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a part of it. Like sometimes you think you want to avoid, we slip into thinking we want to avoid or get out of the negative experience as fast as possible. It's like, no, like we want to be present with that because it is part of what makes the entire experience at the end so rich and so Mm -hmm. fulfilling is that it wasn't all, you know, daisies and rainbows Mm -hmm. um it was like there was there was some hardship there was some suffering i found something out about myself i went deep yeah um i decorated my pain cave a bit (laughs) Um, so yeah wow so we've heard about some of the low times um and you probably have a million more um do you have any high times like i'm picturing spending that much time outside in the mountains being almost like a almost like a spiritual experience, you know, did you have any moments where you really felt connected to something bigger than you or, you know, whether that's the outdoors or whatever that looks like for you? Absolutely. Um, I mean, immediately comes to mind. What comes to mind is I I've already mentioned, I love fifth class terrain. We had this day where we were doing the Martin Bonanza dark link up and we were going to do the Bonanza Dark Traverse, kind of this famed like razor ridge, somewhat chassis rock, fifth class movement. Some people are like, oh, it's 5.8. Some people are like, it's 5.6. There's mixed information. Mm-hmm. Everybody talked about it taking at least six hours. Um, and we get out there and you know, look at our watches. It's like, we don't have six hours of daylight left. And uh, we don't want to be on a razor ridge in the dark right. with chassis rock. <laughs> Um, so we just like get jamming, like, don't even, like, we didn't even pull the rope, never pull the rope out on fifth class terrain the entire time. Like all of it we managed. And, you know, that was the benefit of having a partner with a high risk tolerance who also climbs like himself. He climbs five. I don't climb five thirteen. I'm a mediocre rock climber. I'm like five, five, 10 D at best. But still Um, no rope the entire time. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. We did not use a rope on, on any of the fifth class because it just stayed within, within what was reasonable and acceptable of, of style and risk that, that we, we were able to navigate. Mm -hmm. Um, So we get into this, you know, just flow, like we're making these moves and jamming around, popping over the top of this razor ridge back and forth with, you know, a thousand feet of air on either side. Um, And just like jamming across this thing. And then you get off kind of the fifth class onto fourth class and third class terrain. And so you move faster. um, And then you get back into a few like fourth class, fifth class pits again. And we fly across this thing and just have this phenomenal like flow experience Mm. and tag the other summit in three hours and 15 minutes. Mm. Um, So just, you know, kind of get this fun little like, yeah, yes. celebration. Yeah, you know, yes. a little bit of you know, cuz I do I enjoy doing stuff fast. That's why I do these FKTs. There's of course. something I love about pushing my body hard mm-hmm. and getting a, a a big experience out of it. Yeah. And so kind of getting out of their peak and being like, dude, we just did that in 3 hours. Didn't even look at our watches the whole time, just jammed. And you know, just like finishing and be like, dude, we did that in 3 hours and 15 minutes. It might have been a little less than that, but just for the sake of argument, like 3 hours and 15 minutes. It's like that's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, then being like, oh, wait, we still have a glacier to traverse and a massive bushwhack down to the PCT. Uh, so we better get moving again. Yeah. Um, and ended up doing this heinous bushwhack down in the dark. It ended up being a 22 hour day um, <sighs> and just like got down to the PCT. And you know how like our brains can kind of like fight off a lot of stuff, be it hunger or sleepiness, if we have to be like 100% dialed. You know, that sort of survival instinct is in there, like adding some extra fuel to the fire, like oh, yeah. extra adrenaline. So you're like awake. We stepped on the PCT after that heinous downhill bushwhack. And it was just like, okay, lights out. Like we tried to walk and we were just like, you know, when you've been driving too long and your head, like you start to head jerk mm-hmm. as you're driving. It was that, but on our own feet. And we like look at each other. It's like, there's no way we're making it to base camp. Like we're both falling asleep on our feet. And so we just, you know, nosedive and dirt nap right there wow. on the PCT after this epic novel day. It just turns into this just huge push, dirt nap at the end with our gear splayed everywhere to pull out our, our you know, minimal bivy sacks. And uh, the next morning, Ashley comes comes up to us. Oh, hey, guys, you know, good morning. And she's like, you know, making us breakfast. Again, superhero, right? Superhero. Right. 
Um, and she's like, a after a bit, she's like, you realize you're only a mile and a half from base camp. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought, we thought we were like seven miles away oh. <laughs> um, from the map. We were like, oh man, there's no way we're going to make it seven miles. Right. Um, so we're just like, it's over. Boom. Done. Um, <laughs> yes. Find out we're, but still, I mean, at the pace we were moving at that hour of the night, falling asleep on our feet, that was 30 minutes away. It might right. as and it might as well have been seven miles. Sure, sure. <laughs> I'm sure that dirt was plenty comfy at that time. Oh, oh yeah. I was staying in the Hilton. <laughs> uh, yeah. Was that one of the high days then? Was that one of those, that, when you walked away from the thing, is that one of the highlights looking back was just crushing that day and just having that feeling? I mean, I know what that feeling's like. You're just riding that super high and yeah, you're almost not even taking care of yourself or eating because like you said, you're in that survival mode and you're, everything's heightened. You're like, Oh, I, we got to get off this thing. It's getting dark. We got to keep yep. moving. <laughs> yep. We, we were, we were, we were jamming in the flow state, which also can make you lose track of feeding yourself and all that uh -huh. for the, for the Ridge Traverse. And then went immediately into the, we got to do this. Yeah. Um, and just like that full dialed, full on sort of send it. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it just went, went right from that into like, oh man, we're done. And you know, wow. we're like, we're out of food and out of water at this point. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, it was a wild day, just a golden, like huge experience. Unreal. Um, What's that noise? That is the uh, water heater that just kicked on next to me. We can <laughs> we can wait for it to kick off again. Will we go off in a second? It should go off here in a second. Oh man, I can edit this out. It's no big deal. I'll just, wow, is a truck driving through there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it should kick off within the next 20 seconds or so. Oh man, it's all good. It's all good. Dude, what a summer. I mean, it's just incredible. Like, yeah. I mean, you could write a book. I think we talked about this before. I was trying to talk you into authoring a book, you know, whether it's uh, some sort of fiction or nonfiction, relaying your story, or you could write a guidebook or a children's book. It could be any of the above. Okay, there we go. There we go. Yeah, no, I mean, I have, I had, I have thought about that. I actually hadn't thought about doing a fiction. That's, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, yeah. I never thought about doing a fiction with I it. I mean, you could change your name. You could change the names of people. Maybe spice up certain, certain stories, and then play down certain stories to make the book work. You know. Sure. Yeah. When you're writing a fiction, you get to change it however you want. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Although, to be fair, this this experience would be its own perfect nonfiction as totally, well. Totally. Totally. <laughs> Holy cow, this is the longest this thing has ever run. What is going on? Are you about to explode? Am I about to die? Is this how I go? <laughs> <laughs> I did 100 peaks this summer and then I die by a water heater. Heater. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, okay, I wonder if there's like an off switch or... <laughs> <laughs> this is unbelievable. It's all good. It, normally, it normally runs for like 20 seconds, 30 seconds. To oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, to jump back into the story, though, yeah. uh, and I mean, like Bonanza Peak of that whole group, the Martin Bonanza Dark Day, Bonanza by itself is a peak people bother to take that 40 mile boat ride just to go in and do Bonanza by itself. Oh, wow. Um, it's like a beautiful fifth class, fourth class, you know, wonderful rock, just climbing to the summit and then coming back down. Um, so like, you know, that's the, that's the cool thing about this project is like individual peaks within a day are like standalone objectives. They're that yeah. beautiful. Another right. day, another day that uh, I bothered to climb a uh, Goody, Goody uh, Mountain, Mount Goody? Yeah, something like that. Uh, Goody, I'll just keep it simple. Um, by the Northeast Buttress, which is like uh, considered a Washington, easy, moderate Alpine classic, right? Okay. Um, Could have taken a, a goalie route on the other side up, and that's the way I went down to connect with Storm King, but chose to climb the Northeast Buttress because it's this classic. It's like nearly 2,000 feet of, of easy fifth class. Um, you're just, you're just going, you're mm. just this, like looking over your shoulder, climbing away from the earth. Um, and you know, it's, it's a peak you can't see the top of from any road in the state of Washington. Mm. Um, you can't, you just can't see it. And yeah. so like the only way you get to experience it is being like way out there in the back country, um, on top of another peak or by climbing it. Yeah. 
and you know just got to have this super amazing experience and I mean I was fatigued that day so there was suffering involved too um but just like climbing through making these fifth class moves just you know hours hours mm -hmm. of just these excellent movements and being exposed and like soaking in the views um and then yeah like laying on that summit after that was just like mm, yeah, yeah that's a good day yeah a good day but a good day um just in that beautiful flow everything's clicking everything's going good mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's it's just an insane insane summer man like coming out of this do you like after sometimes after i run an ultra marathon i'll run a hundred miler and it's you know there's the anticipation of it all building and building you run the thing you come home and you get a little de depressed for a couple days it's like ah i'm home i'm back to the grind did you feel any of that you know it's weird with this one um I mean, I don't usually feel that because I'm able to, I'm able to channel it into what I do for my students as a teacher, oh. but I think I especially didn't feel it with this one because it doesn't quite feel over because of the whole like documentary thing that's been building and getting hashed out and all that. Oh, and that you know, it's like, it's like the story is still alive. Yeah. Um, and there have been some low days. Like I've had some funky off days where I was just depressed. Um, you know, like that's part of what you have to embrace as a part of the ride. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to have highs, you're also going to have lows. Yeah. Um, and you just got to, you got to embrace it and be like, it's going to be okay. I'm going to be low for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had some days that were like that. They, they oddly this time they were kind of hit and miss. It wasn't like a consistent low. It was like fine, 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 super low day. Mm -hmm. And then back to normal and fine, fine, fine. And then again, boom, super low day. Um, and just kind of being like, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Stuff's all weird in my body right now. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, you know, normally like you take like what, three to five weeks to recover from a hundred miler. I was like eight weeks out from this one and my body was still toast. And I'm like, did I, did I do, did I do my body in? Is this, is this game over? Like starting to like, you know, question yourself in those ways. Yeah. Um, but recently I've kind of gotten back into a rhythm with some basic training and started like doing some, some one mile time trials because a old college buddies like, Hey, I ran a 534 and every year we race each other to see who can run the fastest mile. We don't live anywhere near each other. Uh, he's <laughs> up in Alaska, but we always send each other at some point during the year, one of us will send a time to the other and be like, ha, who's going to win this year. <laughs> nice. um, so that kind of got me fired up again. Like, yeah, let's go out and run a fast mile. And so he ran a 535.1. And on my first test after the Bulgers, I was only able to run a 539.9. And I'm like, oh, dang it. This can't be the year he beats me. Um, and so I did, uh, just the other day, I did a, a wind assisted downhill, uh, mildly downhill mile. Um, and I told him, it's like, that one doesn't count, but I ran a 537.1. So kind of got my confidence back up. Like, okay, okay, the training's coming together. So I'm going to put this on the track here, here in a yeah. week or two, and I'm going to get you, man. Nice. Um, so that's been kind of a fun way to like, you know, have that, that intermediate goal to, to chase, to get the rhythm going again and get the stoke built up and kind of be like, yeah, okay. My body still can do stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is next? Do you know? I mean, I feel like that's a question I shouldn't really even be asking because you should just be soaking up this entire experience. Um, how long ago did you finish this project? Uh, it would have been August 3rd at 6.04 a.m. Okay. So Not a little to be over too a specific. Month. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, that, so that's two months ago. So you've had a little time to reflect, but are you thinking about the next thing? Are you still thinking about taking this FKT thing farther or what's up? I don't think I'll ever stop being in love with FKT type things. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just love, like I said, I love all the component pieces so much that to have a reason to put them all together is it would be almost silly not to do it. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely some big and some small, simple FKTs that are still on my list of like, oh yeah, that needs to happen. Or I need to create that route. Mm. Um, you know, and that's kind of, it's like, you know, in a way it's almost like, well, to, to not put some of these things out there would be a disservice. To, and I mean, somebody, someone else will think them up like eventually, but it's like, I've got them thought out right now. So I yeah. should probably do them. Yeah. And so, yeah, definitely that. But I also might start embracing some other stuff. Like, I, you know, I've been interested in maybe learning to paraglide. Mm -hmm. um, I've been interested in maybe doing a bit more like skiing or uh, mountain biking. So, so maybe, maybe integrating some time for other things. Cause I was pretty, pretty obsessed with this FKT project. It was like, almost every weekend for a yeah. lot of these, a lot of this time, especially through 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's kind of nice to be like, oh yeah, like maybe I'll go do a race again. I'm actually going to go, um, 
I'm going to do the athletic brewing Oceanside Ironman 70.3. Oh, sweet. Um, you know, I get to kind of come full circle. After yeah, that's that. your background. That was, yeah, that was my background. That was my journey into ultra endurance was through Ironman. Yeah, me too, and actually. So, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, after having this big hiatus from it after the car accident, um, it's like kind of cool coming back. And what's also cool is, you know, it's athletic brewing's event. And they're like, hey, do you want to be a speaker at the dinner? And it's like, oh. whoa, like I get to be the person standing on stage talking about how Iron Man played this role in my life and what I've done since. Um, that's pretty awesome kind yeah. of full circle sort of feeling. Totally. Um, so I'm, I'm really stoked about that. That's coming up here October 30th. So yeah, mm. I get to go compete in the event. And I mean, compete is a stretch of the word. I get to go finish the event casually. Yeah. Um, the body's definitely not competitive right now. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's, that's going to be a cool experience. Good. Well, it doesn't sound like you're slowing down anytime soon. And I like the idea that you're branching off and trying other little interests and, you know, work those fast twitch uh, muscles a little bit rather than the slow twitch, you know, give the slow twitch a break for a while. Um, dude, incredible, incredible summer. Uh, I can't wait for the movie. Uh, I'll make sure and tell everybody about it and uh, put it out on social media and all that. But dude, yeah, just, just tremendous, tremendous. Like, it's hard to even wrap your head around and it's hard to imagine what could, I mean, could it, is it possible to do those hundred peaks self-propelled? You know, I think someone's now that I, that that's the cool part about doing this, like me bothering to do this in a supported fashion with a vehicle. It's like, now it's on the table for someone to be like, Hey, you know what? I'm not a school teacher. I'm, I'm a true dirt bag with, yeah. you know, I, I save up a thousand dollars and I live off of it for months. Um, like someone like that's going to be able to look at this and go, Oh, I can climb fifth class. I, I can take a hundred days. Um, and we might get to see a human propelled. Like I'd be stoked if anybody out there listening is interested in doing a self so cool. Washington Bulgers, I will be on your logistics team. Yes. Um, yeah. I'd yeah. love to see it. I'd love to see it. That's what I'm about. I want to see the sport grow. I want to see people try new things and find their own mission that transforms them. Like, this has been huge for me to be a healthy, like, I don't know if I can say balanced person, um, <laughs> but to like, to find my niche in the world and to find a way that I can feel like my strength or my weaknesses rather become strengths. You know, I'm not a person that sits still well. I'm not a person that like does paperwork well, but I can go out there and move through my world. Um, that's something I can do. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would love to see more people find, find a niche where they can add value by doing what they have a nature to, to, that allows them to do. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Did and I this... think people, I think people will find that the, the documentary kind of has a, a similar message that they're hearing from me now. <laughs> cool. cool. Well, obviously that's what we're all about. The name of my podcast is do big things and we love inspiring people to get out and yeah, do whatever is big for them. Um, did this, did this adventure take up a lot of money? Was it an expensive adventure or did you just kind of dirt bag it and live on the cheap the whole time? I, I dirt bagged it a lot. I mean, uh, lived out of a hollowed out cargo van for most of it. Um, oh, no ambulance. No, the ambulance blew up on my spring break oh, trip down no in way. Bishop. Uh, the engine blew up, which is never supposed to happen to a seven, three people are like, dude, this is, you're so unlucky. I've never heard of this happening. <laughs> I'm like, ah, why? Um, actually athletic brewing was huge. Um, I've mentioned it. I mentioned it. I was like, yeah, no, we're still going to do the, the Bulgers project. That's still on, you know, since they were supporting this film. Um, I'm just running into this issue because my ring blew up. So I'll find something. It'll work. And the CEO hits me up. He's like, hey, you know, would you be willing to throw some branding on the side and we'll pay the difference to get you into something that's running, sell your old one, buy the, buy the not a new one, like, you know, used, but like, we'll pay the difference to get you in something that's running. And no reliable. way, wow. Um, and, you know, that's one of the, you know, I, I love them. Like their, their product, it changes. Like literally since I had the branding on the side, I had people come up during the Boulders effort who were like, I just want to say your product. I'm like, whoa, whoa, not my product. Other people thought it up. <laughs> um, but they would say like, your product changed my life. Like I was an alcoholic, da, 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 da. Um, and it's not hard to like believe in a product that can change people's lives. I mean, I'm a teacher, I'm a health and PE teacher. I talk mm -hmm. about the risks of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and so to actually see that played out by something that I'm associated with is pretty cool. And then just that they would bother to care that my rig broke down um, yeah. when they're the fastest growing non-alcoholic beer right. on the market. Um, like that's really rad. That's huge. Um, God bless them. 
So yeah, no, it was, it was huge. So I was, it, I didn't have time to build it out though. Right. Cause this, you know, c- catastrophe happened and I had to find something that was running. And then by the time I got in it, it's like, there's no way we build this out in three weeks. It's like, just put a bed platform in it with some, some lumber and hit the road. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so lived out of this thing and it ended up being a, a detriment to me on some of that, that heat wave that rolled through that got up to 115 degrees. It's like metal, a metal like oven in there because oh, right? yeah. no insulation yeah. nothing it's just like a bed in an oven yep. um so that was it that probably hurt me a bit that uh, probably hurt me a bit sure um but still it's like i can't complain yeah. I, I got i got to live the dream even if the dream had to be uncomfortable dude um <laughs> that's it man the uncomfortable things are they usually end up being the best things and the things you're scared of uh usually end up being the things that are really calling your name from a deeper place and you did it, dude. You did it. Tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. Um, thanks for doing this, man. We can't wait till the movie's coming out. Um, any shout outs or anything you want to give people? Um, I'll shout out the, the wizard team again, Lauren, Anna, Luke, um, Phil, Galen, like they were phenomenal to work with. Um, Mason and Bill at athletic have been phenomenal to work with. Um, so I got, I got to shout those people out, uh, path projects, um, florists there, those, the shorts that I went through, um, Mm -hmm. not because the shorts aren't built well, but because I was absolutely abusing them on the most (laughs) abusive terrain you can find. Um, you know, he hooked me up with when he's like, Oh, you tore another pair. Like he put another pair in the mail. Nice. Um, just like some support like that. Gnarly nutrition, Eli of gnarly nutrition, just like, yeah, man, we'll, 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 we'll send you some product to keep this mission going. Um, so yeah, just a bunch of people just kind of pitching in in little ways that that made the whole thing. Like, yeah, if I had to pay for everything out of pocket mm-hmm. on this project, it would have been really expensive between the boats and the food and the gas and right. all that. But to have little little ways that different different people got stoked on the project. And, you know, I, and I took the time to build those relationships over the course of 99 other FKTs. So, you know, right. if other people are like, oh, he's so lucky. Um, it's like, well, no, I mean, if you go out and do things and you're willing to invest yourself in it and you're willing to like live all in, like people start to notice. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, some people like we're invested and they're like, yeah, we want to see this thing come through or at least, Mm -hmm. at least see, see you fail magnificently. Like one (laughs) or the other, right? Like this is going to be epic. Um, (laughs) So, cause I think, yeah, there were a lot of people and that was one of the fun things I'll close, I'll close on this story. That one of the fun things is obviously you take a project on like this and there's people who believe that 410 day record was going to stand for a long time. Um, you're going to have doubters, right? And there were some people who bothered to even go as far as being haters. One guy wrote me a, a message. He's like, Oh, here's the official list that we keep track of the Bulgers uh, progress on. Uh, I'd love to see your name on there. want to follow your progress. Actually, I can't wait till you just drop out on Custer. Um, no way. Uh, like threw me some shade, threw me some hate that way. Like, Oh, you're, there's no way you're doing this. Wow. Um, and you know, getting to see him and a few others, like their 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 mindset and their voices slowly get shifted on social media. Uh, another guy was like super critical because on one of my previous FKTs, I made a mistake. I'll own it. I didn't do my land research well enough and I crossed some closed land. And so I had to go in and have the FKT flagged um, on, on the Adams Infinity Loop. Um, and I even paid a fine to the, the, uh, it was on the Yakima reservation. I even like paid a fine to them. Cause I'm like, Hey, I crossed your land. Like, what can I do? And mm-hmm. you know, they were obviously really nice since I bothered to like reach out and say like, Hey, I did this, like right. I want to own it. Um, but yeah, like I made a, made a mistake and you know, he's like, Oh, on one of his FKTs, it got flagged. Cause he like crossed land. Da, 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 da. I hope he's learned his lesson. And by the end of it, he was like, this was a truly inspirational undertaking wow. and to just have that be what he wrote about it. Mm. It's just like, yes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so to, to know that this impacted the community and the people who were supportive from the beginning, uh, getting to have their minds blown and getting mm-hmm. to like cheer all along the way, mm-hmm. um, it's a beautiful thing. And to, to have people stoked to see this film come out and have it, have it play in the Seattle and Oregon areas. Um, yeah, it feels pretty cool to to have done something that matters to other people. And again, that ties into what I said earlier to cl- to, to wrap it up is, you know, this was bigger than just me. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I guess that's why we should chase big things because sometimes you might do something that that's big enough to be bigger than just you. Yeah, yeah, that's it. 
Beautiful, man. Beautifully said. Ride that wave, Jason. Uh, you're riding a wave right now. Just keep on riding it, man. It's it's beautiful. Keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely. Adam, it was an absolute pleasure chatting with you. I, I'm blessed and honored, man. Anytime. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, you're welcome on the show. Anytime you come to Colorado, you better let me know. I will. And I, I, I keep telling you this, but I, I'm going to make a trip to Colorado sometime soon. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. All right. Take care, brother. All right. Bye. I'll see you. Bye.